Turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's been a really good study. If you'll remember in our last uh, lesson that Ishbosheth, I keep saying his name a little bit wrong. Um, he was murdered. Ishbosheth was stabbed by these two wicked men as he laid on his bed. Of course, Abner had been killed by Joab outside of a safe city, outside of Hebron. He had been stabbed in the belly, died like a fool, David lamented. And so now Ishbosheth had no protection. And two of the captains under Abner decided that they would kill the king over the 11 tribes of the, uh, the other 11 tribes. David was in Hebron over Judah. And they brought, they cut his head off and traveled all night to bring Ishbosheth's head to David. Uh -huh. And they thought that they might be rewarded and that David would be happy. And David had him put to death. And he buried Ishbosheth's head in the tomb with Abner in Hebron. And that's how we closed in chapter 4. Now, it's important to remember they had had civil war and that there was two kings because Judah had anointed David king in Hebron. And um, there have been seven and a half years of civil war. And now we're going to see peace. We're going to see David come fully to the throne. But notice this. The other king of the rejected line is now dead. It's interesting that it was his head. That's where the orders come from. It's interesting that it was his head that was cut off. That rejected line cut off now. And we won't see any more of that line until we see Mephibosheth uh, in chapter 9, who is lame in his feet. And so um, we open up in chapter 5, 2 Samuel, and it reads, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Notice first, and I like this, because if you'll remember, we're talking about the rejected line. The rejected king is finished. His head's cut off. And now all the tribes of Israel, those governed by God, came to David, who was the announced, anointed future king. And it's in Hebron. Hebron means communion. And then they spoke. And I think it's important. Jesus says, it's to understand that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28, and you know this verse, through 30, Jesus said, and David is a type of Jesus, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And now, with the rejected king dead and his rejected line cut off, buried in a tomb in Hebron, all the tribes come to Israel and came to David at Hebron, which means communion. And then they spoke. And, and, and it's important, we're going to see, they spoke, and they're going to make a covenant with David. And that's what you and I do. When the rejected king is cut off, we come and we agree, we confess that Jesus is Lord, and God raised him from the dead. Romans 10, 9, and 10. Your, your heart and your mouth agree together. You come to the one who's called you out of darkness, and you speak, and you agree with him, and there's a marriage ceremony that goes on in this covenant. 
in this agreement. And he becomes king of all who come to him. King of kings and Lord of lords. Whether you come to him or not, he is king. Whether you agree, he's king. And so here they all come to David. And we all are to come to Jesus. And it's God's will that all would come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, come, and then you have no ability to come. As some people would teach, because you're not the elect. Jesus declared, come, and everyone who comes will be in no ways cast out. If you want to know if you're the elect, then just come. That's all you have to do. Just come to Jesus, and he'll give you rest rest for your souls because he delivers you to safety that's what salvation means he delivers your soul to safety because it was under a curse of death but notice what it says they said they spoke and they said indeed we are your bone and your flesh now where else do we see something like that that's why I'm telling you Romans 10, 9, and 10. It's the exact same words, and you can turn there. It's the exact same words in Genesis 2, 22, and 23. It's when the first marriage ceremony happened on the planet. It's when woman was created. It's when the first recorded words of man are spoken. Adam's very first <coughs> words, as I looked at this, I went, wow, that reminds me of Genesis when, 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 when Adam said to woman, you are, look at here, it says, and Adam said, this is his first word spoken, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Listen, listen, go back to your text here. And I'll tell you what this means in, in, in the Hebrew. Bone. Get my notes. Bone means self-same body. Remember, I should have read verse 21 where he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he took from his body a rib out of his side. Self-same body, woman was created. Well, see, we, when we come to Christ, we're the bride of Christ. Out of his body comes us. And now we're in Christ. We're part of Christ. We become the self-same <coughs> body. We become one. That's what it means. Bone of my bone. Bone means self-same and it means one. Flesh means body and person. So we become the body of Christ. And so why am I telling you that? Because the nations are all being pulled together. They're becoming one, the self-same under one king, under David. And they're at Hebron in communion. They're all coming together in relationship. And they're all doing what? They're agreeing to the same knowledge. Watch what they say back in our text. Watch what they say. They're going to acknowledge what God has already said in his word. They're going to acknowledge the work that God has already done. They're going to come and repeat what God is already doing. They're not making something up. They're coming and surrendering to the word of God and the will of God and what God has already said to do. And that's what we do in Christ. We come... All oh, you who weary and heavy laden, we come. But when you come to Christ, you don't come to Christ and keep doing what you want to do. They didn't come to David and say, you be king over us. And they kept having their own army and their own little stuff. They came and surrendered and became bone and bone and flesh of flesh. They became married together, one nation. We come and become one with Christ. And he's our head. He's our king, the king of kings. Listen, when we come, it's not... If it's not in surrender, listen, when we come to God, if it's not in surrender saying that we no longer want to resist your authority, then we really haven't come. If you say you a prayer and you say, I said a prayer and I'm saved now, and you come and you still resist the will of God, you still resist the work of God, you still resist the ways of God and the word of God, and you still say that you're not king, then he's not king. You become one with him. That's what it means to come to God. And you stop resisting his authority and you begin to surrender to his lordship. Or he's not king at all. 
Notice what happens. What, the, what do they agree? They agree to truth. Look at verse 2. Truth. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, the rejected king, you were the one who led Israel, those governed by God, out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, listen to the word of God. They knew this truth all along, but they were not submitting to it. That's the problem in the body of Christ. We know the truth, but we're not submitting to it and obeying it. Now they're coming and they're bowing down and obeying it. They're in communion. They're restoring this communion with the king. You shall shepherd, you shall feed, it says in the King James, my people Israel, and be captain, King James, ruler over Israel. They always knew it. Listen to me. They knew what the truth was, yet where were they at when Saul was chasing David and they knew the truth? Where were they at when the rejected king and Abner puts another king on the throne? And they're like, we like this. Okay, we're not having to go to bow down to the future king. Listen to me, that's death. What happened to Ishbosheth? What happened to his captains? What happened to his commander? They all died because they were rejecting, resisting, ignoring, not submitting to what they knew to be truth. There's only one way, one truth, and one life. You cannot say you know him and continue to resist his authority over you. And the only way to come to him is to believe in the finished work of his Jesus Christ on the cross. But when you come, you can't keep resisting. When You haven't came if you keep resisting. You have not come to the throne and said, you are Lord. And God raised you from the dead. And I believe that your blood covered my sins. And my soul is paid for. And now you're my king and my Lord. And I surrender. Yeah. Hasn't happened if we continue to resist and do what we want to do. They knew the truth. Look at this. Feed or shepherd. Meant, God already said that he was going to be king, the future king. We already know Jesus is going to be king. Even when we were running and we were listening to the rejected king, we knew who the real king was. Even now in our life, we might be running from Jesus, the anointed king, the Messiah of God. We might be resisting his authority and still out there letting Ishbosheth be our king, even though we know he's going to die, even though we know it leads to death. Even though we know it's wrong, we already know the truth that Jesus is the only king. Just like they knew, David was supposed to be over all the tribes, yet they resisted the truth of God's word. We can do the same thing in our lives. Are you resisting? Or are you surrendering? Even when we were running before, before we come to salvation, listen to me. We might have been running with the rejected king. Even in that, God was still sovereign and Jesus was still king. We just didn't know that he was sovereignly protecting us, that he was keeping us. He had angels protecting us, Hebrews tells us, until the day of our salvation. To the day we would come to him. To the day we would stop resisting him. The angels are protecting those that are appointed to salvation. But how are they appointed to salvation? God already knows that one day in the future they were going to surrender and come. It's foreknowledge. God doesn't learn anything. It's not like he said, oh, I'll just take him, him, and him. Forget you guys. No, he died and rose again. He poured out his blood so that everybody could come. He just knows those who stop running with the rejected king. He knows those who came and said, I believe it, I submit, because I know the word of God says you are going to be king and rule over all those who are governed by God. Notice it's governed by God. That's what Israel means, governed by God. We cannot come and keep resisting his government. That's what the world is doing. In Isaiah 9, we're told that. The government will be, upon, is it upon his shoulders? Is that what it says? Yes. Pretty awesome, huh? 
So here he is. He's tending the flock. That's what it means. And that's why the word in the New King James is shepherd instead of feed. But it's so interesting that that's what he called him when he restored Peter to wholeness. He said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my flock. Tend my sheep. Feed my lambs. That's what David's going to do. David is concerned about the people. David has a heart after God because David's more worried about the people than he is even his own life. He has the heart of a shepherd, the heart of God. He's going to rule over, but he's not going to do it with a heavy hand and a thumb and make them forced laborers like the devil does. He's going to serve them, and he's going to take care of them. He's going to protect them. He's going to go out and fight for them. And that's what our Lord Jesus does. He took every bit of the wrath. He took every bit of the pain. He took every bit of the suffering at the cross so that you and I could live in peace and have rest underneath his kingship. And when David's got his eyes on the work of the Lord, when David's got his eyes on doing what God wants him to do, he's a type of Christ. But when he gets his eyes upon himself, upon his own life, then he becomes a wretch just like us. But he's still a man after God's own heart and needs to repent just like you and I do. And we might go through stages like that, but we need to come back to Jesus and be washed in the blood. And then it says in verse 3, Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king in Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Now you might not know it, but that's like the third time he's been anointed. He's the Messiah. He is the anointed of God here to be king. To bring them in the rebellion, to bring them together in peace. There was a civil war going on. And from the tribe of Judah, David is raised up and brings peace in the land. Well, he's going to. He's got to go through some wars first. There's got to be some battles first. But peace is still the future. And so the elders come and do this. He was anointed by Samuel. Remember when the rejected king? He was anointed in Hebron when he came back to communion with God and surrendered to God and his work and his ways and his will. And now he's been anointed here and he's brought all the tribes together, all of Israel, 12 tribes, to stop the work of the rejected line of Saul. Who's a rep he represents the devil in this sense, a type of. Verse 4. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. Interesting? Jesus was 30 years old when he began to minister. You had to be 30 to become a priest. You couldn't even start, so he waited. He submitted to his father and his mother until he was 30. Then he became an itinerant preacher. And he reigned 40 years. 40 is the number of judgment. Interesting. So he was 70, another important number. The Sanhedrin was 70 over the nation of Israel. Jesus said, how many times should you forgive? 70 times 7. 70 is a big number. 70 years they were in captivity because they uh, would not keep the jubilees of the field. I don't know the full numerology. We know seven is the number of completion. Finished. It's interesting, though, that not only was David 30 years old when he began to reign, but so was, look at Genesis 41. So was Joseph, who is a type of Christ, who became ruler in Egypt, 41, 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. That's where Jesus is at now. His spirit is going all around looking for those who will surrender, those who will come, those who will be willing to do the work of the Lord, those who will allow him to finish his work through us and be the body of Christ. He's a type of 
type. And then it gives you the details. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all, all those governed by God, Israel, and praise Judah. Notice that 33 years is also the age of Christ when he was crucified. About three and a half years, he has an itinerant preaching ministry. Then he surrenders his life and lays it down, and his blood is poured out for our sins. And we know that God received that perfect blood sacrifice. The life is in the blood because of the resurrection. It's the evidence that he was the Messiah because God raised him from the dead on the third day. <clears throat> Verse 6, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem. You know Jerusalem is mentioned. If Jerusalem means um, foundation of peace means peaceful it means teaching peace what are we supposed to go and teach people all that Jesus commanded we're supposed to go and teach peace teach Jesus and that's what surrenders when they come to their it comes to their conscience Jerusalem uh, just happens to be the holy city but it's also the most mentioned town in the entire Bible Jerusalem is none mentioned more so they go the king and his men, the king and his men, now they're all one. Listen to that the statement. The king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. Now the Jebusites are not one of the tribes that are joined with them because there's 12 tribes that come from the patriarchs of uh, uh, Abraham and down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Jebusites are ites. They're, they're, they're something that's in the land that should not have been in the land. In fact, uh, it comes from a word that means... Uh, trodden threshing place and the Jebusites were probably run out of the land and came back listen to me this is very important they were supposed to be defeating all those ites in the land and it looks like they have come back and showed back up again and the inhabitants of the land the Jebusites who spoke to David saying you shall not come in here uh-oh, listen to me. There's those in the land even today that said, you shall not rule over me, Lord Jesus. You might be God, but you're not my authority. We're going to have a one-world government, and we're going to set up our own little utopia. And they're going to tell you how they're going to do it. And they're going to rage against God and against His authority. Listen, don't be caught up in that spirit. Those who come to Christ, they stop resisting. Those who come to Christ, they bow down and they learn what the truth of His authority, His instruction, His word, His ways. And they beat the flesh into subjection. It's part of the Bible. It's part of our instruction. Don't get me wrong. Christ took everything for us. But just to receive that, you would be stopping at the starting line. There's so much more that we're called to do if we are in the kingdom of God, if we are the children of God, if we are the called according to his purposes. So here there are some that says, you cannot come in here. The fool has said no in his heart, but the blind and the lame will repel you. Look at that. David, you can't get into this city. You can't come in here. Even the blind who can't see and the lame who can't walk will repel you. They will. What's the word? Hither you? Hither you. Is that what it is? Yes. It, it, repel, it really means they will drive you back. They will force you to return pretty amazing it's a city of peace the blind and the lame listen to me when you were once blind it was okay to say no to Christ but you're not blind anymore 
Listen to me. If you believe in Jesus, how can you keep resisting him and saying no and saying don't come in here and you build up walls to hold him out? See, it's natural. This is what's happening here. Jerusalem was a natural fortress city, high above everything else. Three sides of it covered by valley and is on a hill. And then on the front side, we're going to see here in a minute, the Milo was the citadel. It was big stones built up so you couldn't get in on the other side. So it was such a powerful stronghold that nobody should have been able to get in. And you and I, we build up these strongholds in our life. We build up these places and we say, no, Jesus, you can't get in this room. This room in my heart is not yours. No, you can't come in here. And we try, the devil puts a blinder over our eyes and he tries to keep us blind. That's why you have to read the word of God. You have to surrender. You have to be in fellowship and let other people go, hey, I think you're blind in that area. You need a little bit of admonishing, a little bit of instruction, a little bit of help. But what do we do? We get mad at people. I like to stay blind. You ain't going to tell me what to do. Lame. It's always, anytime you're lame, you talk about your feet, your shoes, you're always talking about your walk, your life. Listen, we might have walked all crooked before Christ. We might have been blind, but once we know him, we stop being blind. We start looking for his light and his truth and to be a witness. And we start walking in the way we're supposed to go. And he makes our path straight. The blind and the lame can re keep him out. But when he opens your blind eyes and he gives your, your legs strength, we have to go and tell other people. There's no stronghold that can keep him out except your will. When you say, no, you can't come in here. No, I resist your authority. But that's not salvation. That's not a heart that's looking to be delivered to safety, to be in his family, to come to his house for eternity. That's not salvation. When that rebellion is met in your heart, that's witchcraft. That's the rejected king ruling. That's your flesh ruling. Listen. We need to be those trusted men of God those trusted men of God who's not afraid to tear down the trusted strongholds of other people's lives. <laughs> when, they, when they go, I'm agnostic. I don't believe in God. It's okay to keep praying for them. It's okay to keep talking to them. It's okay to keep witnessing to them and to climb up their trusted stronghold. See, look what David does. No, this is what they're thinking. It says that the blind and the lame will repel you. They'll hither you. Thinking, this is what they're thinking. David cannot come in here. Really? Now think about it because David is a type of Christ. And those who think their strongholds are good and they've got a better way. And they think. God can go anywhere he wants to go. Where can you go from his spirit? It's his planet. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. They think that David can't come in here. Nevertheless, what did David do? He took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. This is the first time Jerusalem is called Zion. City of David. Huh. I like Zion. I like the city of David. Because this is where he's going to rule and reign from. Not only David, but the future King Jesus, too, from the new Jerusalem. Not this Jerusalem, but the millennial kingdom, I believe. I believe. Now, David said, now he took it, we're told instantly he took the stronghold. Let's just look at 2 Corinthians 10. I want you to see this fight song. 2 Corinthians 10, you need to remember this. Paul writing to the church in Corinth. He's defending himself and his apostleship from the Lord because they're talking about him and saying he's weak and he says to them for though 10.3 of 2 Corinthians for though we walk in the flesh he ain't lame anymore 
His eyes have been opened. He's meeting with Jesus. We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly or carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Isn't this good? That's what we're talking about, strongholds. <clears throat> See, there's strongholds in your life. There's people that say no to God, and they think their stronghold's going to protect them. They think that their money's going to pay them off. They think that their good works are going to balance out. They've got strongholds in their life. They think it's going to be okay. And you and I, in the Spirit... We need to be praying and asking God how to share with them. Praying for their souls. And never think that somebody's too far gone that you can't keep praying for them and they can't be saved. Don't give up on them. Think about it if God would have gave up on me or on you. Christ never gave up on us. God doesn't give up on us. We can't give up on people. It's all about souls. God doesn't give up on anybody. There's nowhere that his love can't reach. And he can tear down any stronghold. And when you ask him for wisdom, I'm not going to go with that text any further. When you ask him for wisdom and you just talk with somebody in love and you pray for them in love, God gives you opportunity to share with them. A friend of mine recently got saved. It wasn't, wasn't really a friend of mine before. I just knew him. And it's so amazing that when you look at him, he's a different person. When you talk to him, he's a different person. And we've been praying for him for 10 years. And you know, he's a classic example of what people don't understand. There's going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. <laughs> Things are going to happen in your life that hurt to get you to cry out to God. The amazing thing is, I said, well, I'm a pastor. You know that, don't you? And he's like, no, I didn't know that. And I later told him, I said, I told you that several times. You just never was listening. But now you're looking. And God has opened your eyes. And he's called you out of darkness. You're not blind anymore. You're not lame anymore. You can see now, and you're worried about your walk. You're worried about how you treat other people. And so on Monday, he read three chapters in John. On Tuesday, he read four more. On Wednesday, he got his new Bible he ordered after asking counsel about which Bible he should get. And then he read the rest of the book of John. And yesterday, he started in Acts. And he's a work in progress like all of us. But he's not blind anymore. He's not lame anymore. And he knows where his help comes from. And it's kind of amazing. And it's good for an old pup like me. It's good for an old dog like me to see somebody genuinely get saved and genuinely desire the word of God and genuinely repent and say, no, it was my sin, it was my wrong, and I want to be right with God. And genuinely, all I'm saying is, it helps my old heart to know that God's still saving people. And nobody had to get him to say a prayer. Nobody had to get him to do anything except God opened his eyes, he seen his sin, and he repented. And he said, well, what do I do now? Because God was doing the work and not man's religious system of culturanity. And God tore down the stronghold. God tore down the stronghold. Let God tear down the stronghold in your life. Let the wisdom of his word, the, the, the light of his word, let the spirit of God search your heart and know you and see if there's any wicked way in you and lead you in the way everlasting. Stop resisting. We're going to talk about it Sunday when they, we talk about the, the nation of Israel still resisting. Yeah. Stiff neck and resisting God's authority. That's what's wrong is we resist the truth. And truth is a person. Verse 8, now David said on that day, what day? Day of salvation. Today is the day of deliverance. Whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. 
Why? Because the lame and the blind said, you can't come in here. The lame and the blind are thinking David can't come in here. Listen, but when God opens your eyes, you're not blind anymore. When God heals your legs, you can walk now and you can invite him in. You can have fellowship in Hebron. You can have communion with him. You can agree with him. You can stop resisting him. Whoever climbs up, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Your eyes have to be open. Your ears have to be open. He's speaking to your heart. You have to begin walking. Allow the Spirit of God to do the work of God for the will of God. So you're in the way of God. The way is Christ. And um, they climbed up through the water shaft. Whoever climbs up by way of the water shaft. See, it was impossible to get into Jerusalem, to the Jebusites. Except with the wisdom of God. Notice what David does, the wisdom of God. Somebody climb up. The water came in through this little tunnel. And, and he climbed up inside the tunnel, past the water, through and got inside and defeated from the inside. Listen to me. Because that's what happens. The Holy Spirit comes inside. The water's inside. He climbs up your stronghold and he tears it down. He opens your blind eyes. He gives your lame legs strength to send you out to tell others. But if you resist the work of the Holy Spirit, you stay blind. <clears throat> you stay lame. And you can't come in to David's house. You can't come in to Jesus' house. Then David dwelt in the stronghold. He lives there, the Holy Spirit, in the stronghold. And called this, it the city of David. Sealed. Bam! And David built all around from the Milo and inward. Isn't that cool? All around from the Milo, which is the stone wall in the front, blocking the only penetrable place, the Milo. And then inward. He's, he's working in your heart. He's building the character and the fruit of Christ in your heart. David was building it in the city of peace. The foundation of peace. Teaching peace. Verse 10. So David went on and became great. Name above names. If you're talking about Christ. One day every knee will bow. Why did that happen? And the Lord God of hosts was with him. He's the one called him. He's the one that anointed him. He's the one said David shall be king over all the nations. And he's the one that said Christ shall be the Messiah and deliver us from our sin. David became great because the Lord was with him. And Christ now has all authority in heaven and earth because the Lord was with him without measure. He was the Lord, God with us. Then what happens, Greg? Oh, Hiram... King of Tyre sent messengers to David, messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. Isn't that amazing? The people around David want to be at peace with David. And they sent supplies and help, and they built him a house. It's interesting that Hiram, I don't even know if that's how it's pronounced. You know what it means? My brother is elevated. They recognize those who are laboring around them. And they come and help and they brought the supplies and they helped build the house for David. 
It's the same thing for us. Christ has been high and lifted up in our life. Then you will bring the supplies to help build the house of God. You'll bring the things that build the body of Christ and want to win the souls for Christ because that increases the house of God when souls are saved. They recognize the work. Hiram, seeing his brother being elevated. Have you seen Christ being lifted up? Have you seen that he's been given the name above all names? Then come and help him build his house. Help him build his house in your heart and around you. So David knew when he sees this help coming, he knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Notice that David didn't say, I'm going to go build a monument like Saul did. David knew the reason God put him where he was at was for the sake of other people, for the sake of other souls, that he had done it for the sake of others. Christ didn't do what he did for himself. He did it for us. He was already king of kings. He was already on the throne. And he came down and became a man to win us, to save us, to pay for us, to redeem us, to give us an inheritance in his house. David is the type here. And he knows. What does he know in his heart? He has been lifted up. You and I have been lifted up so that we can help God's people. We can go find them and tell them so we can do the work of Christ for them. So what does David do? He bears more fruit. Ooh. David took concubines. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says he shouldn't do that. Do you understand that? Now we're seeing some of the flesh of David. He's going to take more concubines and more wives from Jerusalem. Listen to me. Let's just read Deuteronomy 17, 17. We got a few minutes left here. I want to finish this chapter. I want to make a couple more points. I want you to see it on the paper, though. 17, 17 of Deuteronomy. Hope I got that quote right. Let's do 17, 16. But he shall not multiply horses, that's his strength of the earth, for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return to that way again. 17, 17. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. The king was not supposed to do that. You and I are not supposed to do that as kings and priests for our God. David was not supposed to do it. God allowed it, but believe me, every one of them was noticed by God, seen as sin by God and rebellion by God. And guess what? God gave him grace, but every one of them caused problems in his life. They caused pain in his life. And God gives us the desires of our heart sometimes, but it brings leanness to our soul. It, we will reap what we sow. So let me ask you. See, let me, let me just tell you real quickly. It was customary to make peace with people around your kingdom. And so what you would do is you would marry their daughters. And that's what some of what David was doing. He was trying to show his strength and he was trying to be at peace. But God is our peace. Christ is our peace. He's, you know, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. We're told in Proverbs 16, 7. When your ways please the Lord, he makes even your enemies to be at peace with you. You don't have to marry the world to be safe. You don't have to marry the world to have peace and rest. David began to marry things around him and make his own peace and it caused more pain and more war in his kingdom than you'd ever know what you have to do is fully trust on christ trust him to be your peace and be bold for him stand strong for him and then it goes on and it tells us um, 
more sons, more daughters were born to David. Now these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem, Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nephag, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, Eliphat. Now when the Philistines heard that David had anointed, or excuse me, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. Remember the Philistines, they represent the devil, they represent the enemy, they represent the flesh. So as soon as there's an anointing of David, as soon as a person comes to Christ, there's going to be an attack by the enemy. Before you can establish foundation and firm ground and his kingdom can get established, they attack. They attack. And David heard of it and he went down to the stronghold. He trusted God. You know what he said? Oh, you looking for me? Remember the John Wayne movie? Heard you been looking for me? You're looking for me, partner? David didn't fight. I forget what he said. What was it? I was thinking that before. Oh, my goodness. What was that big line that John Wayne used to do? He didn't go from. <laughs> yeah, but he said something about. You been looking for me? Or something. Yeah. I hear you been looking for me, cuz, or something. I forget the line now. I'm over here in the wrong place. I'm sorry. But that's what David did. He didn't back down from the battle because he knew God was his strength. He knew God was on his side. He knew that God would brought him peace. He knew that he could go out and use God's wisdom the same way we're seeing Stephen do it in the New Testament in Acts chapter 7. He's standing for God. He's been anointed by God. He's king of God. He's in his perfect place where God said he would be. He's in communion with him. So the enemy comes looking to attack and he goes right down. Uh, that's what he said. You looking for me, pilgrim? Is that what he said? <laughs> I'm going to have to go look that up so we can talk about it next week. I haven't watched a John Wayne movie in 15 years. So the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the Valley of Rephaim. Rephaim, you know what that means? The Valley of the Giants. That's what that is, Valley of the Giants. David's like, I already know when I trust God, I've defeated giants before. Let's go. Come on. It's the Valley of the Giants. But what did David do? So David went at him, took a sword and cut his head off. No, it is a different battle. David inquired of the Lord. He sought counsel. He said, Lord, you're my shield. You're my strength. You're my conqueror. You're the one who's anointed me. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? He's ready to fight, but he looks for marching orders first. That's what you and I are doing. We're being equipped. You come into somebody's presence. You say, Lord, what do I say to them? You wait for God to give you wisdom. You wait for God to give you a, a spot to be able to reach in and punch him on the nose with some truth. Oh, you ain't supposed to do that? It's war, people. We're behind enemy lines. I don't know why we think people are going to be nice to us and they're going to treat Christians in a really good way. We've been lulled to sleep by that. We are at war. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. They killed Jesus. If you think they're going to love us, there's something wrong with our Christianity. When we're doing what the Bible says, they're going to hate us because they hate him. They're going to want to kill us. We should expect that if you're behind enemy lines and you're at war and you're in the foxhole and you're looking for the enemy and he starts throwing bullets, you don't stand up and go, hey, don't call me those names. It's war. The devil is trying to kill and steal and destroy us. He's coming to rob us. He doesn't want us to do anything except die. Why does it surprise us when nobody wants to hear it? I, 
we got to get this in our mind. But see, Christians have been thinking that it's okay just to play. We're entertained. We can just have some fun. You don't do that when you're at war. Yes, the war's already won, but we're still behind enemy lines. We haven't crossed the finish line. We're still holding ground. We're standing. Just like a lot of our soldiers over in the Middle East, and they're standing there holding the ground that's been won by other soldiers. That doesn't mean that the enemy all around them is not going to try to kill them at every chance, drop bombs on them, deceive them. It's still war. We need to wake up. So here comes the enemy, and we need to inquire of the Lord. Where are they fighting? Why are they fighting? What are they saying? Listen to me. They want to kill Jesus and any of his representatives. Look at the battle going on in our country right now. Every bit of it is for life. Every bit of it is to kill the next generation. They don't care. Abortion is about killing. Abortion is about killing the next generation. Abortion is about killing an innocent baby. And they want to kill Christians too because they don't live like they do. They don't believe the way they believe. The enemy wants to kill. He believes in death. And he'll kill his own to get to you. Because he has no allegiance. It's the way communism is too. Power up from top down. Jesus came and serves from the bottom up. He laid down his life. He came not to, to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom. The devil wants us to serve him. And that's what a government that takes everything and wants to force you to do their way is. It's a demonic government. Are you talking politics? No, I'm talking demonism. I'm talking demons that are trying to run our country. I'm talking demons that say, we're going to get rid of all the cars. Really? 300 million cars? You're just going to take them too because who wants them if they're not worth anything and we're not driving them? So they're just going to take it from you and that takes a communistic state of demonic power to come and take your stuff because it's better for you. Listen to me. What are they going to do with them? They're not going to reimburse you any money for it. And they're talking about doing it within 10 years. And those who know say you can change a country in seven years. All you have to do is tell them enough lies. All you have to do is enact enough laws. All you have to do is dominate them because they're asleep at the wheel and they don't care. And listen, listen, don't serve government. We serve God. He gives us wide open information if we'll listen. You don't want your heart to be so trapped into a political party that you follow them blindly when they start killing babies. That you follow them blindly when you think that they're part of God's kingdom. I don't care which side it is. We serve God. He's our king. We're tarrying here, standing until he comes. If one of the party chooses God's stuff that lines up with God, we'll take that. But that doesn't mean that that party is on your side. You better be careful with it. I'll say it again. I, I still don't know that Donald Trump's not the Antichrist. Ooh! You don't know till you see the end of a matter. If I seen him get saved and read the Bible on Monday night TV to the nation and tell them to repent and we stop killing babies because we're going to be judged for it. We better wake up. I'm not saying that he is. I'm just saying anybody could be at this point in time. But we follow Jesus we're not following the rejected line of Saul and Ishbosheth. We're not following the rejected world to turn into sway of the wicked one. We get our marching orders from truth, and truth sets us free so we can 
march freely and stand for Jesus and be ambassadors for Christ. Nineteen B. And the Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal Perzerim, and David defeated them there. And he and he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me, like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of the place Baal Perzerim. K in my Bible means, means literally master of breakthroughs. You got some enemy? You want to know who the master of breakthroughs is? You know who will break through and tear down the stronghold? If you inquire of him and you cry out to him, you know who will give you wisdom that, you can, that nobody can resist? It's God Almighty from any enemy. 21, and we'll close this. And they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. What was their images? Their idols. It was their gods. It was what they worshipped. They were able to take their gods and throw them in the trash or whatever they did with them. King James Version says they burned them. Burned them, yeah. You're right. I read that. That's the Old Testament says too. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> what, your, what, what is it? Oh, King James. I don't James. remember where it's at, but I remember it being in the Old Testament. Yeah. Then the Philistines went up once again. So the enemy doesn't just come once and you're done. I'm fine. I'm good now. No, he keeps coming back. Remember when the devil even attacked Jesus? He waited for a more opportune time. He went and rallied the troops and he said, I'm going to go again. I think I can get him in this area. That's why we need each other protecting each other. And we need the Holy Spirit and the word of God. And we need to stand with the armor of God. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of giants. Bunch of giants coming, people. But God's wisdom will tear down. He'll break through. Therefore, David went right out and he started fighting again, slinging away, just cutting off heads. Notice what David does again for the next battle. He inquired of the Lord again. There's the enemy. What is this coming, Lord? Why is that coming? What's going on there, Lord? Why does my knee hurt? I'm telling you, your body can be part of it. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Every single little thing that's going on in your life, it can be an attack. It can be a warning sign. It can, but it all is called for you to inquire of the Lord, to run to the Lord, to ask of the Lord, and to trust in the Lord, to become dependent upon the Lord. What that, what's what happens? He inquired again of the Lord, and he said, You shall not go up. Just think if he would have ran right in. Thinking, God delivered me once, I'm going to go do the same thing again. God doesn't always do the same thing. That's why you have to talk to God. He knows where the enemies come from. He knows what he's going to do. He does not want you to get to glory. He wants to make sure he gets to glory. Because if you steal his glory, he'll leave the room. He said, you shall not go up this time. He acquired everything's the same. He said, circle around this time behind them. Come up from, upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. Isn't that funny? Mulberry trees. The God knows what's there. And it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the top of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you and strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so and the Lord, as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Gibba. As far as Gezer. You see that? Look at the relationship he's building by talking to God, by asking God, by listening to God, by obeying God. And Geba means a hill, and Gezer or Gazer means something cut off. Listen, he drove them back and out of the land and cut them off where they couldn't come anymore. Now, the Philistines are always going to come, but the teaching I want you to see is that God cuts off. Sin in your life. He cuts off the enemy in your life. He teaches you as you inquire of him, as you trust in him, as you obey him, as you listen and do it his way according to instructions, he teaches you that he's a faithful God, even when you're faithless, because he cannot deny himself. And he does it differently, but he wants you to be talking with him and be dependent upon him. 
and to know that he doesn't always do it the same way. And if you try to run out and do it the same way every single time, you'll develop habits and legalisms and traditions and ways that leave God out instead of allowing the Spirit to lead you and the Word of God to lead you in each situation as you're needed for each battle. And you'll miss the relationship of being with God and knowing that He's speaking to you and knowing that He's the one that made the noise in the top of the mulberry trees with some birds that took off and it scared the enemy to death and they fled. And as they fled, David and them pursued quickly and destroyed every single one of them. But you want God to be out front. You want him to be the leader. You want to go where he's moving at. And you want to do it according to his instruction. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you that if we come, you'll give us rest. That we can be yoked with you. And your burden is easy. We don't have to do anything but stand and build a love relationship with you. Wow. Forgive us, Lord, for all of our tradition. Forgive us for our legalism. Forgive us for our ways that we make up religious actions and works. Lord, help us to recognize your work. Recognize those who are doing your work and get involved with them. Lord, help us to esteem those with very high love that are doing your work and get involved and be part of that community of love. But Lord, help us not to mistake and think that love is letting people do what they want, when they want, how they want. Because you've called us out. And if we've come out, then, Lord, we need to stop resisting you and your authority and your kingdom and your instruction. You are King of kings and Lord of lords, and we give you praise <coughs> in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.